we had to cut a capital budget significantly this year. And what I learned in the uh, uh, conversation that I was in uh, Fairbanks with is that 16,000 construction workers are not working today because of the cut in capital budget. That's painful. That's tough. And talking about cutting the capital budget seemed to be easy in comparison to cutting our operating budget. But the impact to Alaskans who either contract or work for contractors in Alaska is significant. And so I hope you will remember the number 16,000 people who are not working today. In that, in that context, we're asking the state employees to forego a contractually agreed upon number, true, but we're also asking them to help us implement a clause in that contract that said it's subject to appropriation. It's, it's, uh, we're, we're asking them to be a part of Alaska uh, who have to squeeze in tight when half of our income has showed up. This is a spending increase when we can't afford it. Education is a spending increase when we really can't afford it. It's a negotiable item. The budget that we're dealing with uh, is having to look at the hard reality. When I was in Fairbanks over the weekend, the number one recommendation coming out of the governor's conversation uh, was an income tax. So we're going to be asking the people of Alaska to dig into their productive pockets in the small business world. We're asking the people of Alaska to think about taxing themselves at their number was 15% of uh, your federal tax rate, so an income tax of 15% more uh, of your taxable income. Uh, we're talking about unprecedented times in Alaska in that regard. And so giving a cost of living increase when we have some people having no living capacity in Alaska is what we're talking about. So it's a tough argument. I don't know that, uh, how we'll end up in this argument, but uh, what I told people in the Fairbanks area as I was wandering around was, it's just that tough to reduce government spending. It's just that tough. And yes, the number $800 million has been shown as a, a number that we've cut, uh, and some of it is uh, uh, very, very hard. But that means there's going to be people not showing up for work. I remember being on the budget subcommittee for the DNR. Eighty positions were cut. Forty of them were people working now who won't be working later. Uh, but if we go ahead with this cost of living increase, then it's more people that won't be working. And we're trying to say is by holding off on this, we can maybe bridge between our ability now and how we figure out ways of using our savings account better, our, our income capacity in the oil and gas field, uh, and yes, we'll talk about credits. I mean, they've been laid on the table, but you can't just do them with a knee-jerk reaction. So uh, uh, we're spending our savings in such a way that in two years, we, not be, we, not, we may not be able to do our education the way we've been doing it in significant ways. And so we're going to the people of Alaska saying, will you give up some of your permanent fund? Will you give up some of your income? Will you uh, quit asking the government to do as much as they're doing? And in the discussion is, do we give a cost of living increase under that very scenario? Nobody envisioned that we'd be in that discussion just this time last year. So here we are. It's a tough discussion. Uh, I'm trying to make a context, a good sense of it with no disrespect for those who had been promised a cost of living increase. Because those of us who have many, many state workers in our family feel the weight of that. So it is with no disrespect to them at all. We just have to ask those tough questions, and the questions get tougher as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. President.